a huge hand, guys. Give the Lord a huge hand. Thank you, Melissa. Thank you, worship team. I'm telling you, it just keeps getting turned up in here. Every Sunday morning, the intensity of God's presence just keeps turning up. And I welcome that in the name of, of course I do. I welcome that in the name of Jesus. Oh, my goodness. In Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Are you all ready to get into the word? I'm going to start a, 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 I believe I'm supposed to. Uh, God told me to do this, so I'm going to do this. I believe I'm starting a series today. It's called the Habit Series, how we form our habits. And it's going to go over several Sundays. And frankly, I don't know. It could go till Jesus comes. Because I realized something not long ago. I actually have been speaking about habits for about 22 years. I really have. It is a, everything we do is, a, is, is born out of habit. I am 61. I don't know. You know, the other day I had a stupid attack. I was talking to, to Kristen, our daughter Kristen back here, and she was trying to figure out about dates and, and you know, how old I was. I said, si, si, uh, sweetie, I said, sissy, I, I am, I'm just think 41 on 41. I actually was in my mind thinking I was 41 years. I've been 41 years married on our anniversary, and I'm thinking it's 41 and 41. It was, and I said, no, wait a minute. I'm 61. I lost 20 years in two seconds. I realized I'm actually, I am actually 61. And I got here with a lot of habits that carry me through. If you don't believe you're a person of habit, you pay attention to how, start thinking about it. Because if you start thinking about something, it'll mess you up. Think about how you, dry, now, now I don't want you all to picture this, but think about how you dry yourself off when you get out of the shower in the morning. You start at the same place, and you wrap it up at the same place. We are people of such minute habits, we don't even think about it. We don't. We don't even think about it. If you start thinking about what you do with that towel and how many times you fluff your hair with that towel, you'll sit there and count one, two, three, four. It'll, it'll, it'll mess you up. But I promise you, you'll start in the same place, you'll end in the same place. I promise you, when you pull in your garage, you, you, you hit the garage door button about the same place every time as you're pulling up at the garage door. You're full, I'm serious. We are a lifetime of habits, some good and some bad. Jesus, Jesus developed the habit, and I want to talk to you about the habit of overcoming today. That actually, it's really, it's, it's more like the habit of surrender. Because remember, the prayer that he prayed in the garden was a total surrender prayer. He overcame through surrender. Now, doesn't that sound like an oxymoron? He overcame, not by fighting his way through it, he actually overcame through surrender in the garden. He overcame his fears, if there were those natural human fears he was dealing with. Father, Father, let this cup pass from me, oh, if, but not my will. He admitted that was his will. That, that right there in his flesh, that was what he'd sure like to see. That's what he was saying. And, and it was allowed to be recorded that way, that there was this internal struggle. He wanted to please the Father, and he, he overcame by total surrender. It's a picture of surrender. And I want to talk to you really about the habit of surrender this morning. But our, habit, our, our lives are our habits. They are, they're just these tons of habits that we don't even think about. And that's why I want to talk about this habit of surrender or this habit of overcoming uh, this morning. You know, we, we, we tend to, there are times we surrender, our, and I've seen it through the years, through the generations. I've watched just uh, every decade surrender a little more of their children to the world's control. And we're starting to see now parents fight back. Parents getting more vocal, parents attending uh, school business meetings, school board meetings. We're starting to see parents getting more involved. And by the way, we always believe in it should be done in a respectful way. It should be done in a way that honors God, not in a militant way, but a, a way that truly honors God. But we, we have generation after generation that surrendered more of their children's future to the world, teaching them what it was. How do I know that? Because years ago, I can tell you, I've, I've seen it many, many, many times through the years. Parents would pull up, I mentioned this to you, at the other facility, parents would pull up under the, the colonnade and they would drop their children off and watch their children run up into, uh, up into the church and they would get, the, tell the children, make sure you check into Sunday school. And the kids would go in and the parents took off and had breakfast and coffee somewhere else. Or they went shopping somewhere else. They don't know what we were teaching their children back there. 
get that. They don't know. And you know what? This is just, by the way, this is just kind of a safety thing. They also don't know who's in the restrooms in the church. We have parents that release their children believing the church is the safest place. Isn't that the oxymoron? It's the total opposite of what we'd heard for two years, that the church is the safest place in the world. And I believe we've been proven that that just is not true in some situations. But they would release their children, and the children are in the restroom by themselves. I don't know who's in that restroom with that child. We, have, we, we surrender our, our, our families. We surrender our time more. We do things that we give so much time uh, to the things that are not eternal. We give, we give time to things that are not eternal. And when the eternal comes, before we lay down our, our, our head at night, oh, got to pray. I got to pray. Well, I'm glad we sense that need of we got to pray. But maybe we should have started the day off with, I got to pray. We surrender our time. My, I was with my dad Thursday. By the way, he sends his love to you. He loves you all. He always sends his love, and, and, and he made us. He's getting just this sweet little guy that just kind of— do you remember the Tim Conway? And I say this with all affection if my dad's watching this. Remember the little old guy on, on Carol Burnett, Tim Conway? The, the little— yeah. <laughs> Ted Ball. Ted Ball? Yeah. Ted Ball. Okay. You would know that. <laughs> He's, a, he's, he's dawdling around, you know, and this is what he says to me. Bear, Bear, I don't have much time, so can we just talk about Jesus? Now, he was serious about that. He said, if we could just spend whatever time you're here talking about Jesus, because I don't think I have much time, and I just want to talk about my Jesus. Uh, Chaplain Earl, that sure sounds familiar, doesn't it? Guy that wants to talk about Jesus all the time, Chaplain Earl. So, but we do. We su- we surrender. We surrender things that that are, were never intended. We surrender our thoughts, and I'm going to cover these over the next no telling how many Sundays. We surrender our thoughts. We surrender our words, and all of a sudden we do the. Oops, I didn't mean to say that. But we've surrendered the word instead of being prepared in our spirit for the words we should always be prepared to speak, which are blessings instead of curses when we get upset. It was just an amazing thing. This week, this week, though, I spent that time with him, and it became so precious to me. It became very precious because I realized my dad is now in the habit of every day he gets up, and the first thing he does is he opens his Bible. And he's got—I mean, he really does. He's always—I can, as far back as I can remember, prayed at four in the morning, used to wake me up. I told you those stories used to aggravate me to death because he would pray so loud below me on the first floor, and it was right below my bedroom. My dad had that habit of starting the day before— for the Lord every day. And, and he was, while my dad was not perfect, never claimed to be perfect, he did seek the will of God. He sought the face of God. And that was a great habit that I saw for him. Turn in your Bibles to Romans chapter 8. I'm not going uh, to complicate this anymore. I just want to read God's word to you. And, uh, Romans chapter 8, I'm in the NIV, and I'm going to start at verse 28. Y'all, if you, I'm going to give you time to put that up there, Beth, whenever you are ready. It is Romans chapter 8, and I'm going to start at verse 28, and I'm going to read all the way to the end of that. That particular chapter all the way down through verse 39. It says this. This is Paul, uh, Paul writing to the, the, the Roman church, and uh, he, he says, we know that in all things God works for the good, for those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. Man, I could stop right there. Right there. We know. He didn't say we hope. <laughs> No, no, he's made this promise to us as our creator. We know these things. These are things we can bank on. We know this, that in all things, say, everybody say all things. things. God works for the good. He, He does. God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. Now, that he did not make a commitment to people who live away from him. That, that, he did not say that. All things don't always work good, but when we're covered, and I remember the old song, I'm covered, covered, covered by his blood. You remember that song? It, it's just an amazing, it's a, I, when I am covered by the blood of Jesus Christ. And by the way, I don't know how often it's said that way anymore. And I'm not criticizing anyone for not saying it that way. I'm just saying, I'm finding myself, the older I get, the more I am reverting back to sure biblical principles of the blood of Jesus Christ redeeming me from all sin. And by the way, it goes, it goes on to say, and all shame. 
He didn't just purchase my sin at the cross. The Bible says he purchased my shame at the cross. If you look at what Christ went through, what he had to overcome in his lifetime, his short uh, ministry lifetime. By the way, he probably had to overcome a few brothers picking on him. Before the, before the ministry started. Can you imagine being the brother of the one that mom is really, really watching close because she's got high expectations because she knows how this one came into the world? Can you imagine that? And I, I, I love having fun. I, I, don't, I try not to ever obviously be anti-biblical, but I love dreaming and why not kind of thoughts. Can you imagine? Can you imagine? Can you imagine Jesus sitting at the, at, at the breakfast table and, and, and James sitting across? the table from him and saying, Mom, he's, he's, he's floating again. Would you tell him not to, tell him to quit showing off. Yeah. Tell him to sit down. Can you imagine? I don't know that he could do that because the Holy Spirit hadn't come as far as the, the baptism or with John, his cousin. I don't know when that type of awareness came to Jesus, but isn't that kind of fun to think about? Mom, he's showing off again. He's floating. Tell him to... <laughs> Mom, he's floating my cereal now. Can you, I mean, can you imagine being the brother of Jesus? I would do that if I could. I know I would do, could, wouldn't you do that to your siblings if you could? Just kind of have fun with them, tweak them a little bit. Yeah. If you knew you could, of course you would. This Jesus went through in his lifetime, false accusations he had to overcome. He overcame, he submitted to his father's will by enduring false accusations, but he overcame them. Betrayal of the closest friends, Luke 22. A corrupt system against him, a political system rigged against him. A false judgment by Pilate. He, had to, he literally submitted himself when Pilate said, are you, you the, you know, are you the Christ? Tell us who you are. And Jesus could have said, watch this. He could have. He could have said, watch this. If you doubt, he could have. But he submitted to the will of the Father, and he overcame that moment by submitting to the will of the Father and not his own flesh desires. You know what he said? Remember what he said to Pilate? If you say so. Oh, what would it take? I mean, my temptation would be, watch this and calling all of heaven's angels down. Can you imagine? He had that authority. And he left them right where they were. He submitted to the will of the Father and he overcame. A sham of a trial, oh my goodness, a sham of a trial, mental and physical torture, John 19. Humiliation stripped naked before man and beaten. Degradation. He was degraded before man. His father forsaking him. And he might have been the only one who actually knew that took place. The most alone hour or minute or minutes that Jesus ever existed by himself. Because that statement was to his father. It wasn't to the crowds. The statement was to his father, why have you forsaken me? It was a conversation that he was having with him. And he submitted to that and knew that was the will of the Father. And he overcame it because he submitted to it. And most of all, can I just tell you, he had to overcome my sin. He had to overcome all the bad that Barry would be someday. All of the sin and, and, and wrong behavior and wrong thoughts and wrong words that I would surrender. All of, he died and, and he submitted to the will of the Father and he overcame my sin for me. And this is just, I just want you to, to catch that all before we finish this, this particular chapter. And we know that in all things, God works for the good, and he did at the cross for you and for me. For those who love him and are called according to his purpose, it says in verse 29, for those who foreknew, he, who God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the likeness of his son. That, you know, one of the statements that I, I have heard all my life, and it's one of the greatest honor. I've told you this in the past. I, I have always been honored, not proud. I'm not, I'm not, it's, it's not a pride issue. I used to be proud, and, and, and I'm trying to kill that. I am trying to kill that and learn the difference of grateful heart versus a proud heart. I am now grateful to be an American. But I didn't have anything to do with me being an American. You get that? You know, the, see the difference. I'm grateful to be born in this great nation. 
But I am, it's not a matter of pride because I didn't have anything to do with it. I didn't earn, there's nothing about that that I earned. And even if I did earn anything good, it was through the Father. Y'all picking that up? It says, transformed to be in the likeness of his son. Can I tell you one of the greatest statements that I'm honored to hear is when people say, boy, you sure are your dad. Man, that means the world to me. You sure are your dad. And while I know none of us are perfect, our parents weren't perfect, but it sure means a lot to me. I want to, you know, I've walked up to people and said, man, to a father and a son, you, you two can't deny each other. Dude, you can't deny each other. You look so much alike. Well, wouldn't it be great that somebody said we look like Jesus? It says, to be conformed into the likeness of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those he predestined, it says, he also called. Those who he called, he also justified. And those he justified, he also, what? Glorified. What then shall we say in response to this? If God is for us, what? Who can be against us? I said, if God is for us, who can be against us? Have you seen the heavenly host above you? I said, have you seen the heavenly host above you? There are days when I would like to be like the prophets who could look up and see the heavenly host above us. But I know they're there because God puts them there. God has the habit of faithfulness. He has the habit of faithfulness. And that's where we get that from, is from our heavenly father. He did not, says, it goes on to say, so what shall we say? If God is for us, who can be against us? Who, who did not spare his own son for us, but gave him up for us all. How will we not also along with him uh, graciously give us, how, how will rather he not also um, uh, um, along with us graciously give us all things? Who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? And let me tell you, and that doesn't mean you won't be accused, and that doesn't mean you won't be lied about. That doesn't mean you won't have have things said about you. But here's the truth. I'm talking about before the God creator, the judge himself. There's no, no accusation that will stand against you. There's no weapon formed against you that will ever stand against you. Not before God. And that's the only thing that really matters. It is God who justifies, verse 30, the end of, now now it's verse 34. It is he that condemns, who is he that condemns rather? Jesus Christ who died more than that, who was raised to life. It is at the, it, it, it is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. Verse 35, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword as it is written? For your sake, we face death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. Verse 37, no, in all things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life nor angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future or nor any powers, neither height nor depth, any other else thing in in all of creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. We are chosen to be overcomers by by the habit of surrender. If we are truly, this is what God's Word says, this is what Paul wrote, being formed into the likeness of the image of God's Son. Look at the Christ life. That's the life we have to be looking at as the model. It's not a matter of, I I love this, I want to be just like Billy Graham. No, you don't. He would have told you when he was living, you so don't want to be like me. You want to be like the Creator. This is what God's intent is, that we are created to be in the likeness, formed in the likeness of His Son. And the, and the true Christ life was a life of total surrender, total acknowledgement that I exist. I live, I breathe, I wake up in the morning, I eat, I go to bed at night to glorify God. I I don't exist for any other reason. And man, that's total surrender. I haven't gotten there yet. Have you? I'm just being real with you. I haven't gotten there yet because I still wake up to, to my old bad self every morning and I have to remind myself, I gotta pray. I do. I need to pray because I need to surrender at the beginning of the day, not in the middle of the day. I want to tell you a quick story and then I'm going to wrap this up. C.M. Ward, years ago, I, I, C.M. Ward told the story 
Uh, and it was, it was a great, great story. I actually heard, it was a recording that I heard. But C.M. Ward was the voice of Revival Time Radio. And it went around the world, didn't it? Wasn't it around the world? Yeah, it was around the world. So C.M. Ward was heard uh, around the world, and those who could speak English or understand English knew it. But uh, C.M. Ward tells the story when he was at a convention, and he was uh, uh, up a little bit in years already. And why in the world this happened, uh, I, I don't know. But I know he told the story, and so I just believe it. He said that the assembly of God had booked someone in his room, a young man in his room. And some of you might remember the story. I've told it. They booked someone in his room. And, and this young man, can you imagine sleeping in the same room as Billy Graham? Okay, he was the Billy Graham kind of, uh, of the assemblies of God, I'll say it that way. And, 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 and uh, at least in the Pentecostal world, around the world, that everybody listened to Revival Time Radio. You know, it was in the day of not many people had TVs. And so, so anyway, this kid was put in his, I, I guess it was a hotel, it was at least a motel. And uh, this kid, he, he comes in and he, he you know, he's, he, do you undress in front of CM Ward? I mean, I'm trying to, how, what's the etiquette here, you know? I'm, I'm with this great guy here, and, and, and what do you do or don't do in front of CM? Do you brush your teeth in front of CM? Or what do you do? So this kid, this kid uh, goes into the bathroom, takes his, his, what some people in the Northeast call bed clothes. We call them pajamas here, or, or we just call them whatever you sleep in here, you know, because they're not truly pajamas. But anyway, he goes into the bathroom, gets ready for bed. He, 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 comes, <laughs> he comes in, he, he, he brushes his teeth. He said, I could hear him in there doing all this stuff. And he said he comes in and he kneels down by his bed and he just goes into this long, long prayer. <laughs> this long, impressive prayer. That's kind of like what people do when they go to lunch for the first time with their new pastor. I've, I've done that. I, 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 I wasn't the pastor. I was the one going to lunch with the pastor for the first time. I better pray right. I better pray really good here. That's how we used to think, right? I hope you don't think that way anymore because it's a great conversation with the Lord. It's a great opportunity. But anyway, I had these long prayers, you know. <laughs> well, that's, anyway, this kid does this. Gets up into his bed, pulls his covers up. C.M. Ward goes into the restroom. He thought, well, I'll go ahead and do what he did. So he went into the restroom, brushed his teeth, put his pajamas on, came out, pulled the covers back, slid in, pulled the covers up. Good night, Lord. Kid. That kid. Yeah. <laughs> Next morning at breakfast kid came down into the breakfast area at the hotel. He said, Brother Ward, can I ask you a question? He said, well, sure. He said, don't, don't, you, don't you pray before you go to bed at night? I mean, don't, do, you don't pray before you go to bed at night? I noticed that when you got in bed last night, all you said was good night, Lord. He said, son. C.M. Ward always called everybody like son because he was always, he just had this voice, you know, this deep voice. He said, son, if I waited to tell God everything that I needed to say to him throughout the whole day, look at it like this. He said, I'm married, and if I waited to tell my wife everything I wanted to say to her before the, the, the end of the day, I'd have her up all night talking to her up all night because I should have been talking to her all day. So here's the thing. I've formed the habit of talking to my wife all day and talking to my God all day. And I say good night to my wife and I give her a kiss good night and I say good night to my Lord. And I sense that his presence gives me that good night kiss. Because he has the habit of surrender. Now there's no deep sense of perhaps revelation there. Unless we're not doing it. Unless we're really not surrendering. See, some people think overcoming is this boisterous, in the name of Jesus, praying these loud prayers. I can get loud. But I'm going to tell you what, he's in the quiet place. You know, that's what the word says. He's found in that quiet place where it's just you and God and you have total surrender. At the beginning of every day, I just want to encourage you, just remind you, you already know these things, but I just want to, the word says to encourage each other with these words. That's what we do here. We just encourage each other. And I just want to encourage you. He's faithful to you. There will come a day you and I will see Jesus face to face. We'll actually see him face to face. And I'll be grabbing my buddy, Jimmy. I'll be grabbing my buddy, Jimmy. 
dude, you're, you think you got long hair now. You wait. I'm going to pray you have really long hair on that heavenly body. I'm grabbing my buddy, Jimmy. I say, dude, we're standing in the presence of the king. We made it, dude. We made it. And I think Jimmy was one of those guys that I actually said, I refuse to go to heaven without you. Years ago, I think I actually said that to Jimmy. Years ago. I used to cut Jimmy's hair. He was a kid. He was 12 years old when I first started, when I first met him. He see, I see him back here. Wave, Jim, so everybody knows who you are. Wave. Hey, wave. Lift your hand up and wave. So I, there's no fictitious Jimmy on the back row. Dude, you got to help me a little bit here. We, we pastors have a reputation of stretching stories already. Y'all look around. Jimmy's over here somewhere, you know. But I refuse to go to heaven with Jimmy, and I want you to know Jimmy refuses to go to heaven with a lot of, with, without a lot of his friends because he loves Jesus Christ with all of his heart. He has the habit of surrender. And I just want to encourage you, Father, before we leave this place, I'm going to bring Pastor Mike up here in a second to wrap up, but Father, before we leave the place, teach us again the Christ life, the life truly of surrender, overcoming by total surrender. I will be more like you the less I am just like me. Total surrender in the name of Jesus. And every believer said, amen. Give the Lord a huge hand this morning. And as we go ahead and stand to be dismissed, I just want to close with a um, challenge I have sometimes with someone is, you know, sometimes when folks participate in a, in a sport, you know how much I love my sports, right? They, they don't want to always put everything into practice. They want to try to put it into the game, but not into practice. But, and they failed to, uh, to miss the point that you tell them so many times, especially as kids, you work with youth and that you, you, you play the way you practice. So if you want to do well in the game, you need to practice. You develop those skills, you develop those muscle memories. And that's why habits are so important and, and how we form those habits. And as Pastor Mary said, how we start our day will have such an impact on how our day will go. So the challenge that he gave us is, and the Lord gives us is to start our day with him. I, I shared with you several weeks ago after the men came back from the Stronger Men's Conference, um, one, the, one of the speakers there, Pastor Tim Timberlake, talked about his first 15 each day. And the first five minutes was just him just being there and being quiet and listening to the Lord. And then the next five minutes were just listening to some worship music to kind of help continue that relationship, that connection with God. And it was only then that he took a few minutes in and then he spoke to God. So it just showed you how important it is of what, how we start our day and how our day will go. Um, and before, as we pray to dismiss, uh, I'm so, so you notice a lot of activity going on back here in the cafe. So our seniors have a great lunch plan for after church. So um, if you have any questions about that, you can see Pastor Gene or Beth or Dan or Debbie, and they'd be more than happy to answer them. But they got a great, they got a great afternoon plan, some great time for you after service. So Father, we thank you for uh, this time that we've had. And, and as we go throughout the day, as we go leave here today and go through our lives, Lord, tomorrow, when we wake up tomorrow, Lord, we pray that that if we wake up and we start our day with you and our, we continue our day with you. Same thing Tuesday, same thing Wednesday, Lord, that we start developing that habit of starting our day with you, Father. And I pray for everyone here and I pray that they just take this message with them in their hearts in Jesus' name, amen.